All right, everyone, let's let's get started. We have one hour today um, to go over the state of the market report. Um, that's the, the topic of today of today's webinar. We recently launched this a little bit earlier in the month, but we also wanted to organize this webinar to kind of run you through it because we know this is a little bit of a, a large animal of a report. It's a, it's a very good one. It's a very, very good report. Um, and there's so much information in there. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy, first of all, of course, that we were able to publish this um, at the start of the year to kind of start 2024 with another big flagship report in the powering healthcare sector, uh, but also that we have a, a small opportunity here to kind of just you know, sit down, run you through what we feel like these are the big trends. If you're going to remember two, three things from this report, these are the things you really need to need to take on board in your in your day to day lives, in your in your jobs. We're also live streaming the session on LinkedIn, so whoever is joining us there, um, welcome. Uh, this report uh, was was managed by SE for All. It was developed by ECA in partnership with Odyssey uh, under the UK-funded Transforming Energy Access Program. What sets this report apart really is that it is it is grounded in a database of around 400 health facility electrification projects. So some of these are more audits, most of them are implementation projects, some of them are completed, some of them are ongoing, some of them are planned. They're all different in terms of who is carrying them out, the scale, the scope, the geographies, and all that combined has allowed us to really carry out some, some analyses, uh, dig up some trends, both in terms of the past, where we were pre-pandemic, during pandemic, post-pandemic, and also uh, allow us to infer some potential future trends where we see and where we hope the sector is um, is headed towards. So in the next hour, uh, you will get a brief rundown of some of these main trends from the report. We'll share and reshare and reshare the link of where you can actually find the report in case you hadn't seen it yet, of course. Uh, and then we'll also have some reflections from uh, three amazing panelists um, in, a, in a small moderated discussion. But before we dive into the report, I would like to pass the floor to, to Robert MacGyver from SCDO to provide some uh, some opening remarks. Robert, the floor is yours. Uh, well, thanks for the introduction, Luke. Much appreciated. Um, since around 2016, the UK has supported the energy transitions of a, a number of rural health facilities, firstly through the United Nations Foundation and now through SE for All. That journey really started off with uh, support for clean energy transitions of 62 rural health uh, clinic facilities both in both Ghana and Uganda. A variety of lessons that emerged from that were really helpful. That support then led to use case transitions, including the realization of improved lighting, improved cooling, IT, and even the ability to apply ultrasound tech with a clean power signal. And so clear, tangible development benefits were realized. Of course, the displacement of kerosene and diesel gensets are important, but the real health benefits to women and girls, and specifically maternal and nutritional child health, have really made the case for our ongoing support. The lessons stemming from this work have now led to extended interest in health and energy outcomes, plus ongoing discussions with WHO and others around the role of modern efficient appliances in different healthcare settings, including the role of cooling in medical cold chains served by clean energy sources. So I'm really pleased to read the State of the Market report, which highlights that, yeah, challenges still exist, but there is now a logical roadmap towards addressing the gaps and for markets to thrive as a blueprint for moving forward. Additionally, I'm really pleased that nearly 400 clean energy healthcare facilities in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia have been mapped, are being tracked, and now serve as a database to inform markets and signpost investment. I'm really grateful to see for all and the team for this comprehensive study and look forward to hearing from this webinar. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rob, to, to you and to FCDO for being such long-standing advocates, champions, cheerleaders of this topic, uh, and, and also, of course, active funders. I, I, I'm scared to think where the sector would be if, if, if you weren't, um, but let's, let's not go down that road. Let's be very grateful. For, for the sport that we that we're that we're all enjoying. Um, so without further ado, uh, I would like to move on to the state of the market report itself. Um, the the main course of today's webinar, which my, my colleague Charlie Knight from SC for All and which Iro Sala from ECA will uh, will run you through. So Charlie and Iro, please take it away. 
Great, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the, the webinar. And um, firstly, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to ECA for the tremendous work on this, and also to Odyssey for the work on the heat map and database. So let's start with a little bit of background and context on the report. So what does it do? Well, it provides a comprehensive analysis of the market for health facility electrification. We've We've utilized a bottom-up approach, and as mentioned, within the research, we've taken into account 378 initiatives, 78 stakeholders across 89 different countries. <clears throat> and this is all detailed and listed on the heat map that has recently been, been launched, and you can look at online to find out more information about individual initiatives. So the report really looks across quite a, a different array of of different types of projects, different types of ownership and operation. Um, <clears throat> and then also it um, focuses on three main categories of, of technology, namely solar-based mini grids, standalone PV, and also grid connections. So the report, obviously, it looks at a lot of the challenges and opportunities within the sector. And it also comes up with some practical recommendations for how we can grow the market in health facility electrification in a more sustainable way. You can also see on the left-hand side, there are strong links to several different SDGs. So what does the current market actually look like? Well, at the moment, there's about 1 billion people with healthcare facilities that have no access or have unreliable access to power supply. As you can see in the graph on the right-hand side, this varies across continents and different sectors. So, for example, <clears throat> probably the worst case scenario is non-hospitals in Africa, where only about 50% have reliable access. And then digging a bit deeper, we can see that 15% of facilities in sub-Saharan Africa have no access at all, and 12% have no access at all in South Asia. Furthermore, you can see in the graph that non-hospitals generally have uh, lower access rates to electricity than hospital facilities. And also we found that rural settings have lower access rates than in urban areas. Okay, so now we'll move on to some of the trends. Um, there's a few more than two or three, but hopefully you'll remember a, a few of them by the end of the webinar. Um, so the first one I want to mention is that during the COVID-19 pandemic, there was, um, there was momentum provided to the sector. So as you can see on the graph on the right, there's a peak in 2021, but more generally, we found that there's been quite a steady, steady growth. Uh, so if you look at the numbers from 2018 to 2023, you can see how much they've increased over the time. And then another trend is that we found in terms of the types of initiatives that the most common is power solutions. This is then followed by needs assessment and, and feasibility studies, as well as technical assistance and also advocacy and coordination. Interestingly, we found that needs assessment had become much more common, uh, which is great for the sector considering the specific needs of health facility electrification quite often. Okay, moving on, we have a look at um, the next type of characteristic. So we found that in terms of the average duration of initiatives, this has declined over the time. This is due to different processes and types of procurement being implemented and streamlined, which is good for shortening the project duration. However, this does mean that there are challenges around operations and maintenance and can sometimes be a bit of a lack of outlook in terms of long term and sustainability. <laughs> Furthermore, if we look at the types of systems being employed, we can see that this is um, dominated by standalone solar systems. And in the last couple of years, both of these have provided about 70% of, of these types of projects. We also found, interestingly, that there's been quite an increase in the size of system being employed in these types of initiatives. So, for example, in 2023, about 99% of these initiatives uh, were providing systems that are over one kilowatt peak. Moving on to stakeholder collaboration, and we can see that this has improved um, and there has been progress in this area, but there's also room for improvement. So at a global scale, for example, um, things like the HEPA platform and also the health facility electrification 
energy compact have helped um, increase coordination in this area. Um, but then at a country level, again, there's been improvement, but there's also room for better coordination, for example, between energy and health departments at government level, and also with um, development partners and other stakeholders like the private sector, so that e each party knows what the other is doing. Also, we found that the historical data gaps are gradually being filled, and there's been progress in this area in terms of data collection tools. And this is helping to increase data-driven decision-making in the sector. If we look at the enabling environment, we can see that health facility electrification is being promoted and prioritised more within government. So this could be at national planning level in terms of energy planning, or it could be specific policies that are really targeting health facility electrification. Next, if we look at the types of business models, we can see a general trend away from the traditional uh, donor funding with um, the provision of capex and utilising EPC contracts to more service-based models being used now and the utilisation of ESCOs and energy as a service. Lastly, linked to business models, we found that climate finance is becoming more common as a form of funding and this will provide more opportunities going forward for the sector. Lastly, in terms of trends, we can see from a technical design perspective that improvements and innovation in technology is helping drive the sector, improvement in energy efficient um, systems in some instances is helping to also reduce costs overall of producing solar electricity. In this way, linked to technology, we've also found that remote monitoring has uh, improved and increased within the sector. And this can help to optimize the performance of systems and also provide real time data in terms of operations and maintenance. Lastly, we can see that climate resilient designs are also becoming more prominent and common in this sector. Thank you. And I shall pass over to my colleague Eero now. Thank you very much, Charlie, and thank you from my side as well to the entire team for the help in putting this uh, really insightful report together, which I've thoroughly enjoyed working on. So moving on to the challenges, um, the first one relates to sustainability and in particular the limited duration of donor programs combined with the absence of a long term O&M plan. The initiatives that transfer the long term O&M responsibility to the facilities often disregard the lack of capacity to manage the systems. A second challenge is the lack of consensus among governments about the regular cost the long, that long-term operation entails, translating into a lack of dedicated budget for O&M. In addition, limited regulatory capacity can slow down the electrification process. Finally, there is a lack of certainty around government payments and poor profitability in private facilities. In this context, risk mitigation instruments are important for addressing non-payment risk and increasing the bankability of private sector-led healthcare electrification. The lack of institutional coordination creates misalignments in decision-making. Related to this challenge is the lack of understanding of the unique electrification needs of health facilities, including reliable and un uninterrupted power supply for critical medical equipment and refrigeration for vaccines and medications. Without a detailed demand assessment that informs the technical design of the systems, there is a risk of failing to meet those unique needs due to undersizing. An appropriate design may also lead to projects incorporating technologies that are incompatible or poorly integrated, as well as increased maintenance costs. Moving on to financing and investment needs, approximately 64% of health facilities globally lack adequate power supply, requiring an estimated total investment of USD 4.9 billion. The largest investment gap is in Sub-Saharan Africa at 2.5 billion, followed by South Asia at 2 billion. 71% of the investment is required in non-hospitals, with the remaining 29% required for higher service providing uh, health facilities, primarily for the provision of backup systems. Current capital flows into healthcare electrification are significantly below the required amounts. About 70% of the investment flowing into healthcare electrification programs is provided by multi-donor organizations, with 23% coming from energy donors and 7% from health donors. The majority of programs utilize, utilize CAPEX grants, with a few examples of RBF or blended finance solutions uh, being tested.
The provisions of guarantees and the establishment of de-risking mechanisms are essential for unlocking debt finance. Another avenue is concessional loans featuring below market interest rates or extended repayment timelines. Finally, the integration of DREX into the initiatives can help developers boost revenue. Now moving on to measuring impact. Tracking progress through monitoring and evaluation of initiatives helps identify the approaches that have worked best, improves stakeholder coordination, and leads to a more efficient use of healthcare investments. The first category of indicators used in initiatives is energy related, typically collected through remote monitoring, and includes data on demand, as well as performance indicators used in O&M contracts. A second category is health-related and includes metrics on service delivery and health outcomes. Gender-based health outcomes in particular are increasingly becoming a key focus, including indicators such as availability of neonatal practices. A third category captures broader social and environmental benefits. Social benefits include economic and community development benefits, while environmental ones include the reduction in the use of fossil fuels, which can be directly monetized with DREX. Standardization is crucial when measuring the impact of healthcare electrification interventions to facilitate meaningful comparisons between and within countries, as well as before and after interventions. This is particularly valuable for sharing knowledge among stakeholders of the remaining challenges and lessons learned. In terms of outlook, several risk factors lie ahead with a key overarching risk being the focus on short-term installation goals without developing a comprehensive long-term framework which compromises the sustainability of healthcare electrification initiatives another challenge will be for governments to establish an environment conducive to private sector involvement indeed the private sector is poised to play a pivotal role in scaling up healthcare electrification efforts including energy storage providers o m companies monitoring solutions solutions providers, etc. The energy as a service model is gaining traction, whereby healthcare facilities pay for the energy they use rather than investing in the infrastructure itself. This shift from a capital expenditure to an operational expenditure model will allow more facilities with limited budgets to have access to electricity. By harnessing the power of big data and AI, we can anticipate a more nuanced approach to managing energy resources in health facilities. Finally, we expect an increasing number of renewable energy companies to access climate finance to unlock additional revenue streams. Finally, the following areas of action have been identified for each stakeholder group. Policymakers should recognize the need for long-term O&M strategies and the adoption of a holistic approach to healthcare electrification. Governments should establish supportive regulatory frameworks and align healthcare electrification with national development agendas. The private sector should actively collaborate with the stakeholder community to prioritize areas with less commercial viability, ensuring equitable energy access, and adopt funding models that involve long-term engagement beyond capital recovery. Donors and investors should revisit funding cycles to accommodate the long-term nature of healthcare electrification initiatives and channel increased financial resources towards those initiatives that promote long-term sustainability. Finally, with regards to shared responsibilities, stakeholders should establish a comprehensive taxonomy for healthcare electrification, categorizing countries according to existing infrastructure, private sector development, and governmental capacities. Efforts should be streamlined through enhanced coordination between health and energy stakeholders. Identifying political champions and collaboratively building capacity at the policy, institutional and technical levels is required to ensure long-term long sustainability. Finally, consistently measuring not only installation numbers but also long-term operation and health-related outcomes will allow for impacts to be fully understood. Thank you very much and I shall now hand over to um, the panel discussion. Thanks so much, Charlie and, and Eero. Uh, there's, there's, there's so much to unpack, and we did our best to, to distill it to, to what we feel is the essence, but you see that the essence is quite big still. Um, so I think we, we all just have to go and, and read, read the full report. I think that's my, my, my key recommendation. Uh, I'd now like to ask uh, our, our three panelists, uh, Joan Chahenza, um, Rachita Misra, and Salvatore Vinci, to, to kind of join me virtually on the stage. Um, if possible, please turn on your, your camera as well so everyone can see you, so we can see each other. Um, 
and I'll um perfect um and I'll I'll just dive in with with the first question, which I, I don't know if it's a fair question or not. Um, I, I wanted to ask like what what trend from the report stands out the most for you, but but for me that's that's almost like choosing like, which one is your favorite child. So may, maybe I won't ask you like what's your favorite trend or what's the most important trend, but what resonates like what which ones of these trends do you feel like resonates with what you've what you've been experienced, you know, like in your in your day to day job? Because like, we, we are we're all working on this almost twenty four seven. Um, so I think it it would be interesting to to hear from all of you. Like, what is resonating um, from from these trends? What stands out the most for you? And Salvatore, I see you've already unmuted. So I'm just I'm gonna start with you. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Um, <laughs> you're, you're... <laughs> thanks. This is how we do things. Mm. Salvatore, over to you. Thanks, Thank you. thanks, Luca. Thanks a lot. First of all, thank you so much for the invitation and congratulations for the report to you and team. It's um, it's it's. Uh, I was uh, when I was reading these, uh, I, I I thought is. Uh, is really nice building uh, on the previous report that we have uh, published together one year ago with uh, with uh, with the uh, WHO, um, SE for All, World Bank, Arena, with the help of Selco Foundation and many other actors. I think it is a nice follow up uh, on, on that report and. Uh, and as I was expecting, uh, he highlight uh, um, some of the key issues that we have uh, that we have already identified last time. One of the trend is obviously not surprising. Uh, they they still the issue the challenge with operation and maintenance. Uh, all of us working in this sector, we know that uh, that this is the. Um, uh, what we called in, in in the report one year ago the install and forget approach is uh, is basically the the challenge number one for uh, for uh, the electrification project for the solar electrification project there is uh, it's uh, it's still uh, it's uh, it's it's rightly highlighted in the report and also from the colleagues before that still uh, we have an issue in uh, ensuring the operation and maintenance and the replacement of batteries this is obviously the key trend that we all have to work on. Um, I'm also um, I'm also happy to, to 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 see the numbers related to the to the to the solar standalone system. It's uh, I think from from the stakeholders from the different stakeholders is now clear not only from the energy sector, the solar system are not only reliable um, but also. Um, Cost effective and fast deployment. I was just uh, uh, talking with some colleagues for country office who was uh, highlighting me the cost of uh, electricity in Somalia is one dollar per kilowatt hour. The cost of diesel in Yemen is one point fourteen dollar per liter of kilo of diesel. So in addition to be reliable and fast deployable without the need to wait for the grid. Solar is obviously also the cheapest and the most resilient solution. So um, I'm, I, I, I see that the numbers confirm this and I also see that the, the, the trend confirm the issue that we are having with the operation and maintenance. So I guess we will have the opportunity to talk more about this in the, in the, in the upcoming 20 minutes, but um, thanks and over to you. Thanks so much, Salvatore. Um... Rachita, maybe over to you, given that you're overseeing the arguably the, the biggest implementation project um, in, in the world right now on this particular topic. So what, what do you feel what, what resonates when you when you went through these trends again when you heard them again uh, in the in the past 10 minutes? Yeah, thanks, Luke, and congratulations to the team for getting this all together. Um, I think like Salvatore, some of the things come very obviously. So, of course, it's good to see that uh, so many new initiatives are being taken up and the trend hasn't died out uh, post-COVID. Um, that's when our program scaled as well. And I think one of the main things that happened for us at that point of time was that we were constantly trying to follow a health-first approach. So saying that how do you really... Uh, you know, the main aim is to really look at a resilient health infrastructure, and we cannot imagine doing that without sustainable energy access. Um, and that became more apparent when COVID hit all of us, right? Because we weren't able to think about delivering COVID-related medical services without having all of our health um, facilities electrified. We can't think of immunization without our cold chains being there. Um, and that's the trend that we have seen know us kind of leveraging riding the wave and making sure that you know the champions created at that point of time really look at bigger and bigger commitments so i'm happy to see that that trend is not just for us in india but also is is kind of you know um, maintaining its focus across the um, across the across the world itself um, there is there are few things that I would take it the other way, Luke, your question, or what are the trends that I'm not happy with and we need to change? Uh, so I want to kind of maybe 
point to some of them. Um, one thing is, you know, what was shocking to me was that project durations are decreasing. And uh, I feel like the all the all the projects are pointing towards um, us having deployed uh, you know, electrification projects in the past without thinking of long-term sustainability and o &M models and capacity building in the states and the local ecosystem overall. Um, I would assume that we learn from it and we design programs which are more long-term. Um, and, and that is something that, you know, we really need to kind of create more voice about. So uh, we're again, not just electrifying and looking at one year, two year projects, but actually making sure the right capacity is being built and projects convert into ways that our health departments function from here on. Um, the second piece that also kind of stood out for me, uh, uh, which, which is not a surprise, but I think we need to speak about it more is, is how most of the funding is coming from the energy side. Um, but we do know that projects which are more sustainable um, are able to really follow that whole health first approach because we do know that in developing countries, it's not just the electricity, which is a gap. Human resources is a gap. Medicines is a gap. Medical equipment is a gap. Basic infrastructure around health itself is a gap. And we do, you know, we've heard, I, I hope there are some health practitioners joining as well, but we do know that most of our health providers uh, and health staff, medical staff actually are not not able to deliver services. Uh, many, many times administration actually looks at putting money from staff and training and medicines into diesel generator costs at health facilities, right? So we do need um, health funders to also look at this as something that they need to invest on as a basic underlying infrastructure. Um, Salvatore spoke about the economic effi efficiency of this as well, right? So if you're investing in this today, we're saving tomorrow, saving tomorrow to put in human resources, medicines, etc. And that's a narrative that we need to build on. Um, and the last piece is I understand the energy as a service model is something that is increasing. But personally, from our understanding, energy as a service model happens only when we are not playing the right financial game. I'm using the game very loosely, right? The term game. Uh, but but this basically means that we know, all of us know who have access to numbers that if we are investing over a five-year period time, the better investment is that health facility owns the energy system. Um, and that's basically we're looking at an energy as a service model because that kind of financing is not available, connecting to fund project timelines being shorter. Um, and that's something that I would want to kind of, you know, look at changing as well over a period of time, advocating for the fact that we actually need health departments to own. That's better for actually the energy service provider as well, because they don't have this infrastructure on their records, on their roles. Uh, but also health departments, you know, prefer to actually own this health and, and the energy system uh, themselves. So that's the third trend that I would really want to change in the next report that we do together. But yeah. Let's see. Let's see where we are two years from now. <laughs> um... Points well taken. Uh, Joan, over to you, um, because you're kind of at the, I don't want to say at the inception stage, but at the early stage of uh, of having a big target of electrifying 10,000 clinics um, in sub-Saharan Africa in the next probably four years or so. So what what are you taking on board? What, what worries you? What makes you happy when you see these trends? Absolutely, and apologies, I seem to be having very good network today. Um, so I'd like to thank you, of course, for the wonderful thought leadership piece that uh, you have put out there. I mean, in terms of continuing to enhance the body of knowledge, I do believe that, you know, we've been able to see the trends. And it's really exciting to see, you know, all the new initiatives that are coming on board. Obviously, you know, some of our initiatives like HETA really coming uh, and learning a lot from predecessor um, initiatives to listen to Selco Foundation. Um, so they, they are really a lot of teasing, um, and it's really exciting to learn and adopt some of the lessons that we are seeing in other markets and seeing how we can transfer those to this market. So in terms of um, specific uh, reflections on the report, I'd like to start up by saying that it is great to see an increasing number of governments, including health facility electrification, in their national plans. Um, so looking at both grid and off-grid strategies, um, it is a good start. And uh, reflecting on COP, there have been several you know, um, ministers of health 
publicly announcing that they want to electrify or solarize their health facilities in the next couple of years. So that recognition is really great. And I'm happy that, you know, some of that nuances um, reflect were reflected in the report. The other key thing is the coordination. Uh, you pointed out, you know, the coordination between energy and health. And I think also reiterating what um, Rachel had talked about, I think it's also really important um, to SDG3 voice um, alongside the SDG7, because in most cases you will find that the funders of these uh, programs be undertake a really, you know, health um, within the health um, space. So that coordination and being able to bridge that gap is very important. In addition to that, I really echo the sentiment of uh, developing multi-sectoral coordination committees so that the Minister of Energy and the Minister of Health are really having that coordination and talking to one another. I think it's really important for us to actually be able to break down those silos to be able to deploy in these markets. The other key thing, um, it's just the amount of investment needed to close the gap. 2.5 billion is very little in the grand scheme of things. And I think if truly all the community was to come together and develop a sustainable business model, that to and also bring in private sector capital, I do believe that two, that 2.5 million, you know, is ideally a target that we can meet as a as a community. Um, the other key thing I'd like to point out is, of course, you brought out the issue of e-waste. No one hardly talks about e-waste, what happens after the life cycle of all these solar panels that we are deploying and batteries. And it was great to see a recognition um, with regard to e-waste management and um, you know, having conversation with development partners to develop toolkits to address the challenges of off-grid solar projects and the effect of e-waste after um, the, the cycle and the piece over. In terms of the things that I'd like to see um, that probably didn't come um, through the report, the recognition of productive uses, um, you know, as a viable business model where the health facility is actually able to draw um, and create value chains that support the economic and social transformation of communities co collocated next to the health facility is really something that I think would unlock value and something that has not really been widely um, discussed. The other key thing is um, there is a recognition that 53% of the funding or of the analysis of work that's currently happening is really looking at analysis and assessments. And I think that's a great start, but where we are um, and not to close the gap, I think we need to move beyond the assessment and really try and see how do we take all these assessments and move them to actual implementation. And I think also it's a bit concerning that the time um, to do these initiatives is, is decreasing. So that just tells you that probably, um, you know, what is being preferred is short-term EPC plus uh, maybe one or two year operation and maintenance or the back of that. So that needs to change, um, I guess, as, 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 you know, the donor community and as implementing partners, we really need to see how to change that. It might just be that in the interim, we have the EPC plus ONM, um, and have that for a slightly longer period of time, or in the interim, have an EPC short-term ONM and have like an ONM fund where someone has to pay for the operation and maintenance. It could be through a blended um, approach where the government or the donor, you know, pays for that. But I think, um, you know, the recognition that someone has to pay for that beyond the short-term two-year period is important. So um, I'd like to end there, but um, just to also reiterate that, uh, I mean, there's, there's just so much, um, you know, that you've packed in the last 30 minutes, and I'm happy to, um, you know, have further conversations to really talk about, you know, specifics of uh, the report. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, everyone. Um... One thing that I've, I always notice when, when we're on these calls, um, whether they're bilateral or whether they're webinars, is that we are very good at acronyms. So if any, if we're using acronyms to anyone out there and, and you're like, what on earth are they talking about? Please put it in the chat. Uh, we'll, we'll respond it. Um, and, and my next question is, again, it's acronym related. Uh, Salvatore, this is for you. Because we're looking at the global level. Of course, like we're on the back of a global pandemic massive increase, not just in interest, like in momentum and, and increasing also in action on the ground um, around this topic. Uh, but but with increased momentum, increased action also comes an increased need for, for coordination, of course. So 
we mentioned HEPA on one of the slides. Um, for for those of us who are not familiar with HEPA, what is HEPA? You know, it's another acronym. What is HEPA? How is it helping in the sector? How do you see it evolving as well? Over to you. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Luca. Um, indeed, uh, uh, it's uh, HEPA is uh, is is a platform, energy and uh, health, uh, health and energy platform for action, and uh, the objective is indeed to. Uh, facilitate the cooperation between the energy and the sector, but not only. And the reason why I'm saying not only is uh, because, uh, and this is also one of the one of the trends that somehow is mentioned in the report. Uh, the need for intersector cooperation is not only between energy and health; um, is also with uh, with other actors. Uh, let's keep in mind that uh, I mean we were uh, with uh, with colleagues from UNICEF, Gavi, and Celco Foundation. We were in Zambia a few weeks ago. And they were highlighting the issue that they have with water in healthcare facilities, right? I mean, uh, that, that, that globally, 800 million people, more than 800 million people are served by healthcare facility without any water, no water at all. Um, just, just to say the importance of how energy electricity access can be an enabler for many other sectors. And then, again, the need of cooperation means... Uh, that uh, as we all know, if we bring the kilowatt hour to a facility, by in that facility there is no baby warmer or suction unit or light, that uh, the impact of our work is zero. So again, how can we coordinate with actors working on medical devices, for example, when we go to a country? We cannot cover everything, but uh, we need to really engage with actors working not only in energy, uh, but also with actors working in uh, water, with actors working in uh, medical devices, with actors working on capacity building and many other actors. In that way, we can really use electricity as an enabler for quality essential health services. And, uh, and another key aspect when we talk about coordination is also the importance of, and this is another objective of HEPA, but not only of HEPA, uh, is uh, avoiding the, the silos program, right? The silos project. Until a few years ago, we had uh, solar for lighting or solar for uh, uh, vaccine refrigerator or solar for oxygen concentrator, or different system, different small solar system for different devices. Um, we are changing this. I think I'm very optimistic in the sense that we are understanding that now it doesn't make sense from the economic point of view, from the efficiency point of view, from the health impact, but also from the operation and maintenance point of view. You have to you have to manage then five, six systems in the same facility. Um, this is for a example one of the one of the programs that we are working on together WHO, UNICEF, Gavi, Selco Foundation. We started from uh, the cold chain platform, which, as you know, was uh, aiming to uh, support the solar system for cold chain only. And now we are upgrading that platform. We are now work building on that platform. We are now solarizing not only the uh, refrigerator, but the entire facility. This is an example of synergy of different actors working together with partially different mandate, but that working together can actually have a, a biggest, a bigger impact, right? This is one of the one of the um, one of the initiatives that we try to facilitate in the framework uh, in the framework of EPA, in addition to the work that we have doing also together with you in this year of increasing awareness uh, and, and really make sure that electrification of air facility become a development priority because somehow it still is not the case. So for some reason, still we see that uh, 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 something that is so obvious like the electricity in healthcare facility still doesn't receive the right uh, uh, attention, the right information, the right funding, right? It's such a low-hanging fruit uh, uh, working on solar for energy that uh, donors and government should really jump on it, right? We are not seeing that. We are seeing many uh, mythological billions that have been committed around, and if you and and but we are we still need that two billion that uh, we need to electrify all care facilities. So having that, uh, keep pushing uh, to have uh, electrification of air care facility at the as a key development priority, remember that it is key to reach universal coverage and that health is a human right. We are not talking about market or return of investment only here. We talked about the cost before, but let's remember that health is a human right. So uh, this uh, should really require the, our continuous effort to push this uh, on the top of the agenda. So thanks. Over. Thank you. And, and that I, th I think that resonates with, with all of us. Um,
And I think that that leads us very well into into my next question towards uh, for, for Rachid and for, for John, because you're you're both leading very large implementation projects. Um, but we need several more of these, and even collectively with what you're doing, per perhaps we're covering a quarter of the need in the next five years, but perhaps like it, actually the gap may be bigger. And I guess the other element that we should never lose track of the gap is not it's not static as in if we do nothing the gap gets bigger because everything we installed five years ago eight years ago will stop working if we do a little bit then the gap will remain the same because we're just doing status quo it's like we're, we're always rowing against the tide a little bit so we need to do these massive additional efforts to really make progress and and, and move forward so we essentially like, how do we clone you rachita how do we clone you joanne like a couple of times to 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 bridge the gap. Like, what have you learned already? What do you expect to learn? What are some of the gaps that you perhaps still see um, that that you feel will allow us as a sector to to actually close the gap, to pull in the the remaining funding, the donors, the investors that we need to bring in, but also on the implementation side as well as on the public sector side. Like, what what do you see? What has resonated? How have you been able to essentially get from where you were two years ago, which was close to zero to now talking about thousands and thousands of health facilities being electrified in, in several months already. Um, Joan, maybe I'll, I'll start with you first. Um, over to you. Great, so just to reiterate something that Salvatore has talked about, there is the whole issue of piecemeal application. Um, so we have slowly learning and moving as a sector to make sure that we are looking at auto energy of the health facility and this total energy needs would include the cold chain um, equipment and also um, you know some of this equipment are just you know powered by one solar panel for instance the gene expert machine that does the TV screening and we want to move that narrative to make sure that we are sizing the health facility we are looking at the total needs of the health facility Wash because water and sanitation is report and if to create that infrastructure that then um to our water sanitation system, then we are sort of mending that in as gap. I think the other key thing is also in most when you go away, you realize that you know we are just sort of putting panel uh, relics and panels that are not working. And I think being able to stop and really look at, um, you know, solutions such as retrofitting things that have been installed in the past that are not working would ideally be go along, um, you know, a long, a long mile in being able to unlock some of the value that is still within the other donor mechanisms. Then um, this has been said, but it is worth repeating because I think it's really the fun in the room and what we're trying to solve in terms of operation. And if you do not think about when and from the beginning of the program, then of course you're doomed to fail, right? You don't believe that you can be able to start and think about O and them down the line. It has to be part of the architecture, it has to be part of the program design. And if that is not done, then um, we'll you know go back to the vicious cycle of of uh, you know deploying systems that you know do, don't quite don't last. And I think what is important is recognizing that. There are different steps of moving from a traditional procurement method to getting to you know the energy as a service business model which is really the ideal and those steps look different in different countries there are markets where there's really no private sector participation and for you to be able to move from a traditional procurement method to the other end of a perfect model you then need to have a stepped approach that stepped approach could just be that you know in the interim we are supporting the government um, through some escrow account or O&M fund to be able to have that long-term operations and maintenance. But the thing here is we cannot run away from the fact that someone has to pay for it. And I think as a sector, run, we've run away from it for a long time, right? So just having in place those mechanisms that um, are able to uh, when you get some seed funding, government also has counterparty funding going into escrow account will be that step that we're for as a setter and you know of course the end goal is a pure um, energy as a service business model but for that to work you need to risk mitigation mechanisms in place with private sector capital and i think in the same light um being able to support private sector initiatives the several energy service companies have 
um, institutions that are just waiting for incubation um, for them to actually scale. Being able to support those initiatives is really important. Um, the sector still needs, um, you know, sophisticated mechanisms, and I don't, they're actually not sophisticated because we are applying the finance in other technology, um, you know, technology access initiatives. So being able to have blended finance vehicles and mechanisms that support energy as a service, support mitigation needed for energy as a service is important. I think the other key area that uh, um, in terms of coordination, as I said, we really need to think um, through the distributed of energy credits platforms and just, you know, all the value that we can be able to mine under the, the direct platform. And, um, and I think also there's value also in trying to look at you know, other climate finance initiatives and how those climate initiatives can actually be able to support the deficit that we currently have, the 2.5 billion gap that we need to fill. Um, so in a nutshell, I would say those are the key ones. Um, and and um, what is also really important is um, trying to see, you know, from a private sector perspective, what is the private sector saying? What tools do the private sector need um, to be able to support deployment of, of uh, funding within this space? And as donor communities, I do believe that our funding should be catalytic and should be able to unlock um, capital and bring in this much needed, um, you know, private sector capital and participation. And, you know, developing the tools and mechanisms that can support that would ideally be um, what I'd advocate for. Thanks so much, Joan. And, and, and Rachida, over to you. But, but before you do, I, I just want to build on that point on, on like private sector participation, long-term sustainability, but but bringing on board also Salvatore's point around health as a human right. You know how how do we do this? You know in to, b while balancing basically both both elements. And I feel like I've been saying this every single day, and I'm sure my my colleagues are are getting really tired of me saying this, which is the 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 perfect is the enemy of the good. And I really feel that's super applicable in this situation where we could wait another five, ten, fifteen years for the perfect energy as a service model to arise and then you know, like everything's de-risked and, and every clinic will be electrified. And I say five, 10, 15 years, it could easily be 25, 30, 40 years until like health insurance schemes are set up, et cetera, et cetera. And of course these clinics need power yesterday. It's as simple as that. And sometimes I feel like we are kind of overcomplicating things by wanting a rural clinic in Malawi to be more financially sustainable than your clinic in in somewhere in the UK or in the US or in in Europe, and and that is you know, like we're we're bringing up all these boxes and special purpose vehicles and you name it. So Racha, I'm just curious, like how how are you experiencing this? Where where do you think we should be heading towards on when it comes to like long term sustainability, O and M, the role of the public sector in particular in in making sure that we are able to continue to convince donors investors to keep on putting funding in the sector, especially at that rate that's accelerated as what we've seen in the past, to ensure that we're actually able to bridge that gap by, by 2030 and, and preferably even, even earlier. Because I think at this point, it is not a technical problem anymore. Um, it probably even isn't a logistical problem anymore. We, we know how to get solar panels and batteries to the most remote places in the world. It's kind of like, it's, a, it's an operational model and financing issue. Uh, so, so Rachida, over to you in terms of how, how are you experiencing this? What are some of these, what have you already seen, especially like deploying several thousands of, um, of power solutions in India in the last few months? So absolutely agree, Luke, um, on the two main things, which is one that, uh, uh, you know, let's not complicate systems when, when we need to deploy it tomorrow or yesterday, as you rightly said. Um, and, and second, let's not try to get to that perfect solution, you know, when the need is really, I wouldn't even say yesterday, like a decade back or so, right? Or even more than that. Um, but I think like, you know, the, the main things that we've been kind of looking at is keeping an eye on what we don't know, right? So so that becomes the, the questions that the sector needs to answer many that have been already kind of pointed out through this report as well. What we don't know and making sure that we are 
you know, letting it emerge slowly. Like that's been our approach while we're actually working as well. Like one of the things, two main problem statements that we really are keeping an eye on. One is how do we look at cost efficiency of the overall program? Because in the end, that's what really matters to the people who are going to scale it, right? So if the government wants to scale it, if the health department has to put in money, how much money do they really need to put? And how much money are they putting in right now? What does it really compare to? Right. So those are the things that we're really trying to answer. There are two ways that we're answering this um, and constantly improving our process to do that. One is working on efficiency. Right. So I think Salvatore mentioned around med tech. Uh, right. So how do we really look at efficiency of technologies, even efficiency of buildings, but rest, let's restrict it to efficiency of technologies itself. We know, and I think somewhere in the report, it was mentioned as well, that just by looking at efficiency of lights and fans, we're able to actually reduce the system costing and the system design tremendously. Right now, start looking at medical equipments as well. I think just in our labor room in India, where I would say the medical equipment supply chain would be you know, slightly more mature than the African countries, still we're able to get efficiency gains of about 40 to 60 percent just by looking at energy efficient equipments available in the market today these are low-hanging fruits right so efficient equipments available in the market today which are baby warmers you know phototherapy units um, you know suction autoclaves you know all of those kind of equipments itself what does that mean is that we're not really reducing the cost of the capital expenditure. So we're saying you can electrify two health facilities at the cost of one if you look at this energy efficiency drive, right? But in addition to that, uh, you know, what, what Joanne said, for example, your way of looking at operations and maintenance cost also changes because what you're looking at is battery replacement over a period of time. Cost of that reduces because your system design has reduced. Right, even in terms of servicing costs on a day-to-day -day basis, on a year-to-year -year basis, cost of that comes down because how do enterprises cost for it? A percentage of the capital expenditure, right? So the whole aspect of medical tech equipment, and there are you know, a million other things that we can do. For example, another thing that we're working on is active vaccine carriers, right? So you look at vaccine storage, cold storage units are huge. In some of the smaller health posts that we're electrifying right now, Bigger refrigerators are not needed. Smaller active vaccine carriers are needed, right? It again reduces the energy requirement tremendously. We don't need big diagnostics. We need telediagnostics, right? Again, the energy requirement reduces drastically. So the moment we sort of make the health, health the centerpiece, the innovations start to emerge, which actually feature in the way the energy programs are being designed. That's one. The other piece on the focus on operation and maintenance, we know that's the biggest elephant. We know nothing will scale if actually we don't prove to the people who are mon putting money in right now that these projects are sustainable. And that's something that we, you know, if, if, we, if we don't kind of set the right processes to actually put that in shape, they will look at the past projects and, you know, say solar does not work or um, energy does not result in improved maternal mortality. Of course it doesn't. Doctors need to be present there, right? Um, so the other piece that we've been looking at is really keeping on an eye on operations and maintenance and say, how do we really budget for it, right? So for example, right now we're saying that let's start budgeting for operations and maintenance. How many of us can actually tell the government how to budget for operations and maintenance, right? It's a big black box. Right. So that is something that we're really keeping an eye out for. Um, you know, what do we what can we share with the uh, with the with the sector soon is one is that we have done about uh, 4000 health facilities uh, in the past two years, um, specifically 2000 in just the last three months. So, so just to give you an idea of the way that it's scaling. Right. But what we have done more importantly is in the states in India where these facilities are being implemented, we've created operation and maintenance learning centers. I'll invite all of you to visit. What we're doing is actually keeping an eye on the kind of servicing issues that are coming up, right? So many a times right now when we're talking about operations and maintenance, we're saying we need to have annual maintenance contracts and we need to have vendors or service providers who are coming and servicing the system as per those contracts. The real problem is the breakdown of the system happens quite often because they are public assets and people are changing. Health facility staff moves from one health facility to other, right? So, so system breakdown happens often. 
because of which servicing needs to be observed in a different way altogether. So what we're trying to do is actually say inverter, panel, battery, and the fourth piece being the medical equipment itself. What are the, you know, the main points of failures? How often does that happen? What can be actually catered to through contracts, you know, through warranties? What needs to be catered through, through regular maintenance that happens locally versus what are the main things for which a service provider would need to travel? And when we're saying remote communities and remote health facilities, traveling is not so easy, it's high costs, right? So how do we really accommodate for those aspects in the contract itself? Many a times, it's not just in terms of, you know, the technical capacity that is needed. We need to allocate more money. There needs to be process to allocate money. There needs to be a money pool, as Joanne said, that is there as well for ONM. So those are really the pieces where we are trying to answer questions and hope to establish across different states in India, across different states which have different terrains, different transportation infrastructure, different ecosystem of energy suppliers as well, to say, what, how do we really budget for ONM, right? And, and once I feel we do that, we really kind of have the processes in place which can allow the muscle on the ground to really emerge that the targets that are there on top start to actually deliver on the ground as well into more sustainable uh, practices. Um, so that's really how we've been kind of uh, looking at it. And at all points of time, we're working primarily with the state health departments as well as with the national health um, the Ministry of Health, so that whatever we are learning, whatever we can push out as directions from up top, as directions from the states, you know, we're able to make those changes slowly, slowly, not looking at the perfect, you know, we have all the answers, but whatever we answers we have, we try to institutionalize it as soon as possible. Thanks so much, Rachid. And, and I, I had one eye on the clock. This hour has just flown by, which, you know, is, is as expected. Um, I want to give all of you like 20 more seconds to give to make sure that we we end this webinar with a with a positive message with a little bit of hope. Um, so the question is, we fast forward to 2030, every single health facility is reliably electrified. So how did we get there? What what makes you hopeful that we will be able to achieve that goal? And, and Salvatore, I'll, I'll start with you. Joan, you can go ahead. Then Rachid and, and Rob, if you're still online, please uh, please chime in as well. Salvatore, over to you. Thanks, look. Indeed, I'm I'm very optimistic, and I'm 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 optimistic, and I'm sure that uh, uh, electrifying all the air care facility is um, it's, uh, it's 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 feasible. And uh, the point is not uh, to do it. The point is how we do it. The point is we cannot know. We we cannot say in a five five years from now from now on you will still be there and you will organize another conference, another webinar. We cannot say we didn't know the issue of operation and maintenance, right? When we are, we are working very closely with the with Selco Foundation and uh, and uh, with other actors, with UNICEF, with the actor, with you, uh, with Irina. Uh, th th the point is really how we make sure that this, that, that we do it in the right way and that, uh, that uh, we, that we don't, that we don't say, uh, we just delegate to the government and that's it. We have to work together with them. We have to make sure that the, whenever there is a, whenever there is the, 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 there is a there is a solar system in a, in a, in a, in a, in a healthcare facilities, uh, there is a budget line to cover the operation and maintenance a little bit, but that little bit has to be there for operation and maintenance, for pre preventive maintenance, for replacement of battery. There is a budget line for this in many cases. But uh, as 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 rightly mentioned in, in in the report as well, people think the solar is for free once installed, right? No, we need to have that budget line, that operation and mantra, and we need to push also um, donors and development partner to adjust their funding cycle, right? Because often the issue is uh, that the funding cycle is for two years or for three years. For development partner, but also for international organization, we have to adjust that. We have to adjust. We have to make sure that there is a financing that cover uh, that cover that um, that part of cost. So, government as a role, international organization lies. We all are accountable to make it to make it right, to make it to electrify, and to make sure that there is operational and one um, and one key element is also. Um, there is a lot of discussion about financing, right, and climate financing, right. Uh, you know, 
that at the last COP and uh, and uh, Rachita was actually the, the the key person working with us from Selco on uh, building the the, the that an, an installation, an electric facility installation, a solarized electric facility installation at the climate change conference because we want we want to show uh, people and delegate and COP delegate that when talking about climate resilience, uh, when talking about climate funding. Uh, this this needs to be taken into consideration, and uh, and again we go back to all our organization, government, international institutions, but also but also development partner donors play a key role to make sure that not only we electrify but we electrify in the right way. We 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 think it's feasible, as you said, it's not rocket science. Uh, we have. Uh, we have uh, we have a robot running on Mars on solar system, so not even in the rural area. So it's not a technical issue. It's not a financing issue. If you allow me one minute, I completely agree also with what um, Rajita mentioned before and what you mentioned before. Let's avoid uh, to uh, convey the message that uh, in order to ensure uh, operation and maintenance, uh, it's necessary to go toward ESCO model or energy service model. No, energy service model is one of the solution in the big package of the solution, but going for EPC and adding uh, long-term operation and maintenance is absolutely feasible. So the problem that we don't include uh, long-term operation and maintenance uh, doesn't mean that we need to go to energy service model, which is completely different. We doesn't have, as Rajita mentioned, uh, the facility doesn't have the ownership on the on the of the system and come with other number of challenges, right? What happens if the company goes bankrupt? What happens if there is a lack of payment, etc.? So let's avoid to, to, to give the idea that uh, since uh, there is a lack of operation and maintenance, we can solve this with the solution of energy service or ESCO base, because these are two different things. Over. Thanks. And thanks again for the opportunity. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Salvatore. Joan, over to you, your message of hope. Yes, so very quickly, I do believe that we can be able to electrify these health facilities in sub-Saharan Africa as facilities. Right now, we are creating um, an opportunity for private sector partners through public-private partnerships to be able to uh, bring on board innovation to test so that we scale um, a different business model have the potential for um, electrifying several health facilities of sub-Saharan Africa. The other key thing I'd like to say is we recognize a place for private sector participation, and that might look different in country depending on the maturity of the market and what you can be able to have in one academic to another market. I like what Salvatore has said. Let's work on the solutions that we have right now while we're trying to figure out, you know, sort of uh, the most sophisticated solutions. There are definitely solutions right now. The thing is from the donor community, we need, you know, clearance and, you know, a very good, um, you know, uh, we need to figure out the timeline, right? Because then, looking at, you know, very short um, programs, we need to see, you know, how do we pay for term operations and maintenance. So having said that the $25 billion is uh, very little, let's try and see as a community, how do we create the money to this gap? I know you have one time, thank you, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Joan. Rachita, over to you. Your message of hope for everyone. No, I, I definitely uh, agree with both Salvatore and Joan that, that it's not a big task. We can definitely do it. And there is enough momentum that is there that we you know, just need to create this magnetic field and get more people on it. Um, but I think like agreeing with, with Salvatore, uh, what I would really like to see in 2030 is that uh, we're having more disc I think you know if if we just electrify all health facilities like that's not really the target right because as you said Luke like you know the problem is going to keep increasing so it's really the processes that we really need to change right so how assessments are happening you know what are the technical specifications that we're doing procurement form you know are we actually like designing better systems um, more economically efficient systems as well um, do we have an idea of how to do financing of both capital expenditure as well as OPEX? Do we know how to hand over the asset to the government uh, and build capacities there accordingly? And of course, the you know the big beast of operations and maintenance as well. So I think like I would I would want us as a sector to have moved in terms of having an understanding of those key processes that we figured out on how to do it for health and energy across different 
um, different kind of country contexts. And if we have, you know, that figured out, then everything from there on would go fine. So that's that's my big hope that uh, that you know that's the that's the key message and key learning agenda that we drive in the sector. Thanks so much, Robert. Last but not least, your your message of hope from the donor perspective. Uh, very quickly, um, so I'm I'm really tuned into what Salvatore and uh, Rachita just said, and I think we have you know the ability to sort of think beyond current systems, and I think we should allow ourselves to reflect on that. So energy as a service sometimes might be saturated as a way of working. So sometimes I think you know that exchange that ownership you know, being passed over from the beginning may change those views that, on that perennial problem around o &M. So I'm, I'm really kind of, and I appreciate that 53% of funding, you know, is looking at analysis and assessments, but there's some big assessments there that perhaps we need to sort of reflect upon and maybe even just sort of uh, synthesize what we already know and what we're already saying, you know, about these kind of problems and where it might lead us to. Um, my feeling, is that I think service company led installations with healthcare owned facility uh, capital assets may be a good driver for O&M, but that's a very subjective view and I think needs uh, very much uh, tested. Um, but I live in hope that that can be driven forward, you know, with intelligence because health is a human right. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I, we're about 10 minutes over. That's a sign of a very good webinar. Um, thank you all for, for joining us. Thank you to all my panelists as well. Uh, big thanks to everyone involved in, in developing the report. And, and that includes everyone on the call, uh, you know, panelists as well as, as audience, because this report is only made possible because all of you share information about what, what you have done, what you're doing, what you're planning to do, which interventions you're, you're involved in. So, so I would like to end with, with a call to action, which is to please reach out to us regularly to provide updates on the projects that you're involved in, the projects that you're embarking on as and when they materialize, so that we can really create this database, this dynamic database, and make sure that it it it's, it's continues to be a resource, a useful resource for the sector, and that like, automatically, like we, I mentioned in the beginning, close to 400 um, interventions. Because that's because when we launched this with 387 interventions, the day itself, we already got two, three organizations saying, like, oh, but we actually have done something else as well. Let, let me add it to the database. That's exactly what we want to see. We want to make sure that whatever is happening, whether it's an update to an existing project, whether it's a new project, that we capture it. Because the more we capture, and that's really to Rob's point as well, like, there's so much already being done. And it's this type of, of information, it kind of it democratizes it. It makes available who is doing what where so that we... Firstly, avoid duplication. And then secondly, of course, that we find potential synergies that we can build on, on what has already been done. Um, with all that being said, thank you all for spending this, this hour and 10 minutes with us. Um, the conversation, of course, does not end here. Um, so if you want to learn more, please reach out to myself, to any of, of my colleagues, any of the panelists. We all work together. We're one big, uh, happy sectoral family here. I hope you all have a great rest of the day uh, and a wonderful powering healthcare year. Thank you all.